Thanks. So, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Pietro De Rudas. I work in CISA and collaborate to the development of quantum express and its maintenance with Paolo Giannozzi, Stefano Baroni, and uh, other people that you will meet during this school, like uh, Fabrizio, Fabrizio Ferrari, uh, Ivan Carnimeo, uh, Oscar Baseggio, and others uh, that. Uh, Many others that I can I maybe expect. Uh, so, uh, Quantum Espresso is a is a package is a pro, is a is a project for uh, creating an open source uh, uh, package of uh, open source software for the electronic st structure simulation that uh, started up in uh, two thousand two, almost almost twenty years now. That. Uh, uh, it's been created by the merge of, the, of some pre-existing packages that were uh, some of these components were, were actually quite old. Like for example, there was uh, PWSCF and Phonon that were, uh, that were developed by the group in the group of uh, Stefan Baroni, Stefan De Gironcoli, with the, and with uh, Andrea Corso and Paolo Gianozzi and many others. And the, the and uh, the, this project was measured with the project of the Carpaninello codes that, that were. Uh, Parallel codes that were developed by Alfonso uh, Pasquarello, uh, Carlo Cavazzoni, Nicola Manzani, Roberto Carr, and many others. And uh, this project was created uh, uh, for two reasons. One was to uh, make available uh, uh, innovative methods in, theoret in the theoretical, uh, in the electronic structure computation, and to make these uh, uh, methods available to a wide uh, audience to a wide community of uh, of scientists and uh, and uh, developers and in the other, uh, on the other uh, side uh, together with the innovation the other target was the efficiency so we wanted the, the project aimed since the beginning at having uh, providing codes that were able to run efficiently on the modern computer architectures and uh, to keep the software up to date in order to exploit to always exploit the best the, at the best the uh, the, H, the high performance computing uh, structures that were that are available at the moment. Uh, in these years, Quantum Espresso has become one of the standard source of uh, packages for performing DFT calculations with plane waves and pseudo potentials. It is used by by very by a wide community of scientists to, for making many things. This is, a, for example, this is a, 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 the result of an inquiry that we made on what uh, of what kind of applications are run uh, are uh, run with Quantum Express. So, what which is the target of the of the scientists that are performing them? As we can, as we can see, we have a, a quite uh, variegated uh, type of. Uh, of research and materials that can be studied with quantum espresso, and we have, we have applications that go from spectroscopy to electrochemistry, uh, device microelectronics, uh, and the batteries, uh, and uh, and other technologies related to the new green materials and the catalysis and uh, many others, and. Uh, the result of this uh, wide view of, the, of this wide usage is that we, the code as uh, uh, the, the papers that cite, the papers that illustrate the code have uh, reached almost twenty thousand total citation up, up to now in since two thousand has reached almost twenty thousand citations and in only this year in two thousand twenty two we have had thirty thousand downloads in total. And uh, as you can see, the code is used in a wide. Uh, I mean, it's used in uh, this citation comes from many regions of the world, and actually also the developers that uh, contribute to the code with uh, applications, uh, improvements, uh, bug fixes come from uh, uh, come from many different regions of the world. So it's a worldwide uh, uh, community that. Uh, is, is working and uh, contributing to that. Uh, so a quantum espresso is not a monolithic code, it's a suite of codes, as uh, okay, this, this 
well, obviously it comes also from the region that was the merging of two pack of two different packages. But uh, this is the philosophy that is being kept up to now. And so we have that uh, you have a you have, we, have, we have many applications that can be run one after the other, so they can run in, uh, in, in complex workflows to produce our, the results of our calculations. But together with this, we have also a wide set of libraries, and these libraries provide an environment that can help and can make easier for developers to, uh, um, to implement their own ideas and to implement their own ideas in order to have uh, uh, step forward uh, um, a code that is able to run efficiently on the on the um, the on the, uh, uh, on the state of the art i performance computing machines so uh, the structure is uh, as you can see provides a low level system of libraries that help you to tune your uh, application to the different kind of systems that you can uh, which you can run, then you have a set of domain-specific mathematical libraries that are those that perform the most uh, um, the heaviest part of the computations and, the, and that those that are crucial for having a, per, a, a performance portability in many machines. Up to this, we start with the uh, software that is more related with physics. So we have the so-called modules and the linear response modules and other um, modules that are internal to quantum express. So we are uh, they are, the, the structure is quite encapsulated. They can be reused throughout the code for many applications, but as they use, as, as they heavily use the uh, data structure of quantum espresso, they are not, uh, they cannot be qualified as, as, as libraries and they are meant to be reused inside quantum espresso. And on top of this, we have uh, uh, what we are going to talk in these days that are, in these two days that are the applications. Uh, the, uh, these applications, uh, we have many in the code. There are many applications. The most, one of the most important is the PWSCF code that runs the, um, the total energy and forces calculations and is able to compute stresses, forces, and using uh, with many with many pseudo potentials and, uh, and can run a collinear and a collinear spin density. In, density and uh, many other applications that uh, about which we will talk in, late, in uh, a couple of slides uh, after. Then there is the Carpalinello code that performs instead performs the abolition molecular dynamics with the Carpalinello uh, with the Carpalinello method. Then the, uh, there is a code that performs the natural elastic band method using uh, PW or CF and engine. And then we have another code that we, we, you will see tomorrow, that is the following code that instead is, a, is a, the one that uh, computes the, uh, and the, computes the, uh, the phones and the, uh, the phones, the direct and the, the other linear response, like the analytic response. It is also able to, uh, to compute harmonic terms and many other more with the linear response uh, methods. Another code that is based on um, Linear response is HP that computes the Hubbard parameters using uh, linear response. And uh, uh, one other code that you also see tomorrow is the DFPT uh, suite of codes that are codes that uh, perform time dependent density, um, density functional theory using, uh, using the linear response method of quantum express. So, with this, you can compute the optical spectrum and the other collective excitations like magnons and others. There is a new package that uh, a new application that uh, allows you to compute the energy flux. Uh, we have a fully uh, we have a full uh, set of post-processing utilities that help you to elaborate uh, most of the results computed by PWCF and to, uh, to extract that uh, extract information for uh, uh, for uh, uh, for bands uh, for electronic structure and other informations. Then there is a a large package that is developed by the group of Feliciano Giustino in Austin that instead performs electron uh, phone computations using the linear functions. And the new, uh, a new package has been recently added, that is the KCW, that uh, performs Kuhlman's compliant band structure calculations uh, using the linear functions. And then there are, uh, on top of 
On top of quantum espresso, many other packages are able to uh, use quantum espresso as starting stage for, for computing the ground state and the starting wave functions with which they work. So quantum espresso is also an ingredient for other many uh, workflows that involve other external applications. Uh, so uh, what about the performance in quantum espresso? Uh, we have uh, that uh, the performance in quantum espresso is based on uh, a basal parallelism, parallelism, let's say, that is the one that is based on the RNG MPI group that distributes the three FTD, the three, the, the FFT data, the, grid, the, three, the, the, FFT grid, the three dimensional FFT grids along, among processors and performs uh, uh, scalar 1D and 2D Fourier transforms. Uh, and uh, also distributes the blasts and the loops on the uh, operations on these, on these sets. And this parallelization is, a, is efficient up of one third to the of the uh, 50 p dimensions. And uh, one way to improve the um, this parallelization is to duplicate the RNG groups in order to work on this in the group of bands. This is a so-called task group parallelization. And as you can see in this uh, in this picture, um, the, the efficiency of the FFTs is I mean the okay in 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 blue you have the total the total uh, the total performance in red you have the performance of the FFT library, and in yellow you have the performance of the uh, of the distributed linear algebra for large for large systems, as you can see, what happens is that uh, as, uh, that the while the FFT parallelization keeps scaling keeps scaling uh, with the increase of the number of code. Of course, what happens is that uh, our main bottleneck was is uh, the um, is the uh, is the parallel diagonalization with the parallel linear algebra. So what happens is that at a certain point, uh, using the uh, standard Davidson algorithm, uh, uh, you you hit uh, you hit the you hit the uh, the bottleneck of the um, of the parallel linear algebra and, and your and your scalability decreases. In recent versions of quantum espresso, we have added. A new iterative solver that is called RMNDIS that improves the situation, that uh, makes a less frequent usage of the parallel generalization and allows you to have a better scalability. As you can see here, there is the efficiency, of, there is the speed up with the number of nodes for the same calculation as, as the, the, the plot on top. And, and as you can see, the speed up of the new algorithm is much better. And this is due to the fact that. Uh, uh, we are not using so much parallel diagonalization as in the previous, uh, as with the Davidson algorithm. So, uh, one thing that you will, you won't see to, today uh, because it's not uh, it has not been possible to show the system so, so large is that when you are using systems with many bands, one one of the suggestions is to use uh, this new algorithm that is called RMM diagonals uh, together with the RNG RNG MPI group, you will see afterwards that we have additional parallelization levels that allows you to uh, improve the scalability of the code with using many uh, trivial parallelization schemes that can uh, uh, give you access to the usage of many, uh, of many more MPI reports. This uh, this performance uh, this level the level of performance that we have reached is in, uh, we have been able to port the, this to the um, in system based on GPUs on accelerators. In this case, what happens is that we keep the same distribution of the parallelization levels, but uh, uh, most of the parallelization that happens at the at R, at the RNG level is now distributed. Is, is now distributed within the GPU. So uh, the GPU performs the um, part, most part of the, uh, this parallelization, all loops, I mean, doing this for doing this for um, loops and the blast calls is straightforward because they are uh, done by the, uh, by, the, um, the, by the CUDA libraries directly. 
for the FSTs, we have uh, we have the, the FST library for GPUs has been uh, been refactored in order to be able to execute in batched mode the Scala FFTs, and uh, these are um, executed in batched mode. So we have the executed the six we executed with a batch with a batch of bands to get all together. And uh, the, in, in this case, the computation and the communication are, are overlapped. In this way, we can save, uh, we can uh, improve the efficiencies of the calculation that we are able to use to exploit better the, um, the throughput of the GPUs. Uh, for what concerns the, um, the paralinear algebra, what happens is that the GPU is powerful enough to manage most of the uh, most of the um, most of the most of the matrices in uh, in serial mode. So the parallelization of the uh, the parallelization happens inside one GPU. So in this case, usually the the, the matrices are not distributed and all and, and all the work is done with a serial solver that works on one GPU. Uh, so what is the what is the what is the aim in this case of the PI and MPI parallelization for uh, when you are working with GPU? The main, uh, the main aim of parallelization in this case is to distribute the memory, uh, distribute the data among many GPUs in order to reduce the memory footprint on each GPU. Because the GPU has a, has a finite memory that may go, may go from the 16 gigabytes of the, of the V100 to the 48 gigabytes of the ampere GPUs, but it's in the end is finite. And if you are uh, if you are computing very large systems, what happens is that you need to distribute the data in any case, and uh, this can bring some uh, some improvement in the in the computation time. But mostly, what happens is that you are able to run uh, computations of very large memory. A very, that require a very large amount of memory without uh, uh, without uh, having issues with the memory of a single GPU. The other thing that is important is that as you are uh, able to minimize the number of MPI groups on which you distribute the RNG group, the GPUs allows you to use the uh, auxiliary parallelization level much more efficiently. As you will see mostly tomorrow with the phonon code, what happens is that uh, it's possible to Really uh, push uh, push this these auxiliary parallelization level, levels to the limits in order to have uh, steam parallelization steam uh, and to use that uh, to to uh, yes push them and the, the extreme and uh, getting the, the better performances with them. And so uh, let's go back to what are the um, the, 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 the possible calculation that you can do with the PW code, that is the code that you will see tomorrow. So as I was saying, uh, you can do a lot of uh, CF-based calculations, and you can do them with spin the giant system, with spin for a system, that, uh, and you can do that with a non-collinear or a non-collinear disturbed coupling system. You have access to standard DFT functionals, you have access to meta GGA functional, to other to a set of non-local functionals for um, for, for band bars, uh, well, systems with band device type interactions. And you can also, for one device interactions, you, okay, I didn't, I haven't put it in the slide, but you can, you can, you can also use some of the uh, empirical one device corrections that can then work on top of uh, GGI and uh, GGI, uh, GGI functions. And, uh, uh, then you can you you, you, have, you can run calculations with the Abbard uh, on-site correction uh, and the Abbard recently recently to Abbard on-site correction and also been added the, uh, the inter-site uh, corrections and you can also you can also use hybrid functions with the accept exchange. Uh, okay, well, the code obviously computes forces and stresses, and so the PW code can also run relaxations, nudge elastic band calculations, and molecular dynamics. 
we have a full set of instructions that uh, allows you to run uh, to simulate isolated systems. These systems may be uh, either clusters, so zero dimensional uh, systems, or surfaces, so two dimensional uh, surfaces. And there is a lot, and there is a few. Uh, type of uh, set, uh, setups that allows you to really simulate the isolated system. For example, one of these are uh, the use of the of dipole corrections for two-dimensional systems in order to avoid the uh, problems with the dipole of the slabs. Uh, problems with the index with the dipole of the slabs and so uh, simulate them probably without uh, artificial forces. And you can simulate electric fields using uh, either the, uh, the sawtooth potential, that is the one that is using the dipole correction, or you can also use the uh, homogeneous electric field technique and, uh, that uh, is based on the, uh, uh, the modern theory of, of polarization. Uh, one of the main ingredients for running uh, PW cal calculations with PW are the pseudo potentials. It's a, uh, PW is a code that runs, uh, and it is a plain wave by plus pseudo potential, pseudo potential code. So you need the pseudo potentials. Uh, in, in quantum espresso, the pseudo, the pseudo potentials are not distributed together with the, uh, the package. They, are, uh, they have to be recovered, they have to be. Uh, Downloaded by other uh, by other uh, distributions, the quantum espresso uh, applications usually use the, the pseudo potentials in the UPF format. So you can uh, you need to have uh, pseudo potentials in the UPF format. Uh, there is still uh, legacy compatibility for some very old uh, formats, but uh, uh, for reproducibility, uh, it's much better if you. Uh, uh, convert them to uh, to the UPF format. To convert them in the UPF format, uh, there are a few utilities in the UPF lib of quantum espresso that can be used to convert them directly in this format. Uh, this one. It is possible to use non constraining pseudo potentials, uh, and, uh, and then for most of the functionalities, but not for all, you can also use ultra soft pseudo potentials or uh, PAW data sets. As I was saying, uh, the pseudo potentials don't, don't come with the quantum espresso distribution. They come separately, uh, separately, and so you need to uh, them from other places. Uh, these are a few hints of where you can find uh, reliable, uh, reliable pseudos that can be used uh, with, uh, uh, with minimal verification and uh, Linear verification and uh, without uh, doing too much work for uh, in them. One of the places that uh, you can find them is the, in the standard uh, solid state uh, pseudo potential library of the, that is provided by the materials cloud of the PFL. And this is the link for that. You, you, there you will also find a lot of information about the pseudo potentials they, and their transferability and their reliability. One other place where you can download the pseudo potential is the, is the PS library of Andrea del Corso that can be downloaded directly by its uh, by his uh, um, by his uh, GitHub repository, but they can, uh, then there is the pseudo dojo uh, library that is, is formed by uh, non conserving pseudo potentials uh, with uh, non conserving pseudo potentials with uh, multiple, multi projector non conserving pseudo potentials that have uh, um, um, been uh, um, Computed with the Dorada uh, 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 Other links where you can find pseudo potentials can be found at this link, pseudopotential.quantumspecial.org, where you can find uh, many of the pseudo potentials that can be used. And there, there are also a set of uh, clickable tables where, where you can download most of the PS library. Uh, Pseudo potentials plus other uh, legacy pseudo potentials that were used in past editions of the code. Uh, okay, uh, so PW is the main uh, software that uh, is used for the calculations. And then 
on top of these calculations, you can uh, use, uh, you can reuse this data if you are running other calculations where these data are. The standard uh, one uh, part of one place where you can find this data is obviously the standard output that contains all the results, the information, and the volumes of the calculation. So it's a uh, good policy to always to check there if there is any warning, any, any uh, error simulation. And uh, it's uh, the first place to look for what if the computation has succeeded and uh, what has happened. It has a main, it has not set fuel for the format, so it's not uh, uh, the reliable place uh, for uh, extracting the data that you want to use in the workflow, for example. And uh, instead, the reusable data are all saved in the prefix.save directory. Prefix is a, is a here is a name holder for the prefix that you may choose to, to indicate your calculation. And this directory contains, first of all, the data, the same data that are printed in the standard output. And here, instead, the data are organized according to XML schema and uh, contain all the data that allows you to reproduce the calculation, to restart the calculation, and to use the data of the calculation for, uh, for example, uh, band structure calculation and calculations. Um, together with this, we have also obviously the binary data, the binary data like the charge density file that is uh, either printed in the dot dot format, that is the, the format with the data printed in the Fortran binary, uh, printed as Fortran, in, as Fortran binary files. Or, uh, and this is preferable if you want to reuse the calculation in a machine that is different from the one that has uh, performed the calculation in the HDF5 uh, format. For using the HDF format, you have to compute the code in order with the linking it with the HDF5 line. Uh, other binary files that uh, are needed by most of the workflows are the and the one and the wave function files. There is one file per key point always in the same directory. And uh, there is one file for each key point and spin, spin channel. And also this file can be, can be printed uh, either in the Fortran binary either as Fortran, Fortran binary format or in HDF file, HDF file format. Uh, for example, here I show you one of the typical, uh, one of the most trivial workflows for the best structure calculation, which is the one that one uses for computing the Korshan bands in top of the NCF calculation. And one first performs NCF calculations with PW, and, and then reusing the density from this calculation, one can perform a non self consistent calculation that uh, for computing the um, for computing the bands and each individual key points along the path. And so, and so you obtain the, the path that you want. And then you can use the, the post processing utility bands.x that for performing symmetry analysis of, of your results of your functions and your, and your, and your, and your, and your, and your in your data, and then the, the same uh, utility uh, saves the data uh, for, for plotting them. Yeah, for example, uh, I'm showing you what happens with a non collinear nickel uh, calculations where you have uh, some hint of the spin texture of these bands. Uh, so uh, let's now see uh, a little bit what is the input of the data instead. Here I'm showing you I'm showing you one of the inputs that you will be using today, and the one of the copper oxide. And uh, so as you can see here, uh, you have uh, the, the input is organized in few names, uh, in few names that are control system, electrons, ions, and cell. Uh, these three are mandatory for every calculation. So instead, ions and ions is mandatory only if you perform calculations like relaxations and uh, molecular dynamics. Cell instead is uh, mandatory only if you perform calculations um, where you uh, change the, the sites of the, the sites of the cell. So as I was saying, the first name list is control, where you have uh, if you, if, uh, 
you have a few keys that you can set. One of them, one of it is important is prefix, for oh, example, okay. if you need, uh, sorry? Okay. Um, when, okay, so we have, uh, we have the prefix uh, uh, list that this is the one that allows you to change the name of the prefix that save the calculation. It is important that the prefix to tune up the, the the position of the the, the, guest. the name of the directory where the data are saved for the restart. Then uh, you have the calculation name that allows you to choose which kind of calculation are you doing. Today you will be only doing self-consistent calculations, but here you can indicate the self-consistent calculation, you can indicate the relaxed calculation, variable size of its calculations. Then uh, uh, you, can tell the, you can tell the system if you want to restart or restart the system. And other important uh, variables are, uh, for example, the, um, where to instruct the system to the code to where to write the, the data and where to where to find the the serials. And uh, okay, the other name list is the system. Uh, you have to indicate the information about the structure of your system. Here, this is done usually with the Ibrav uh, the Ibrav. Uh, Flag. Ibrav may be one of the one one of the fourteen uh, the indices, and so it indicates for which structure you want to use. Or you can also indicate, like in this case, uh, Ibrav equals zero. In that case, it means that you are not indicated by the system directly, but you are just but you are directly passing the set parameters at time zero. Then we have to indicate the number of atoms, the types of atoms that you have. Uh, most important thing is the cutoff of the way the way function is set. Uh, if you are using uh, um, if you are using uh, ultrasoft or, uh, or PAW PW data sets, you need also to specify the cut row, which is the the cut -off, and it is the, the cutoff of the basic set for the for the uh, for dense grid, the grid where the potential is saved, then you need to indicate whether you're using which kind of occupation are you using. Like in this case, you're using the smiling with the net vessel packs on the smiling with a uh, width of 0 0.05. Then uh, also insist, always in system, you, 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 you can indicate the, which kind of calculation are you doing in terms of spin and spin and generate, which is and spin equal one and spin equal two means that you are using spin performance calculation with two channels for up and down normalization. In this case, you also must indicate the static normalization of, of, each, of at least one of the species. And then uh, there's the electrons uh, name list that where you uh, set up a few flags uh, from. Uh, Controlling how the um, and the iterative solution of the Kohn-Sham equations are. Done. And then there are together with okay. In this case, we are performing an SCF calculation, so the ions and cells are and cells and the list are not relevant. And uh, just passing briefly to see what happens with the. Uh, the um, uh, with the three cards, the cards uh, together with the name lists, you have a few few formatted cards where you when you complete the specification of the system. The first one is atomic species, where you indicate uh, which atomic species will be present in your system. For example, in this case, oxide and copper. You indicate the mass. In this case, uh, we are not uh, going to do dynamics. We are not going to do for calculations afterwards. So we just indicated a fictitious mass of one, and then it's not a real mass of the system. And then you need to indicate the, num the name of the serial potential file. So it's, uh, it will look for this file in this directory. Or if this directory is not indicated, we will use the environment value, environment. Uh, a variable that is uh, called Espresso Zero C here, as you will do today this morning with exercises. And we we'll look for these files in the directory indicated in this location. And then we have other two, uh, we have other two um, 
counts. One set parameters that is not mandatory. It's mandatory only if you indicate the variable equals zero. We indicate the uh, set parameters. In this case, uh, you can specify which units uh, you're using and then the angstrom on the bar on a lot. And uh, then uh, you, can you have to specify the, the position of the atoms in your system. In this case, for example, okay, the file is truncated, but you need to, uh, to, you need to put the position of, of the atoms and the species of the atoms. Okay. So these are uh, a little bit more information about quantum espresso that you can find either in the website. So the website is quantumespresso.org. If you want to download the code, you need you can download it at this link. A few papers that illustrate quantum espresso are these ones, these two papers. This is the paper of 2009. A new paper was issued in 2017, and the very recent one is uh, issued in 2020, and where uh, uh, we illustrated the advancements done in uh, the GPUs. Uh, if you want to find out uh, about the Quantum Espresso Foundation, uh, this is the website of the Quantum Espresso Foundation. And, uh, um, if you're interested in the development version of Quantum Espresso, this is the, um, the link to the, um, to the GitLab repository of Quantum Espresso. And um, that's it. Uh, thanks for your attention. Enjoy the, enjoy the tutorial after this. Thanks. Thank you, Pietro. So, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Fabrizio and I'm uh, one of the developers of uh, Quantum Espresso. Uh, I work in group uh, with Pietro, which you just uh, saw his presentation, and uh, with Ivan Carnimeo and uh, Oscar Baseggio and uh, other people which uh, we, we will meet uh, tomorrow uh, while doing uh, hands on various codes of Quantum Espresso. Today we will just focus on uh, PW, which is the self the code for the self-consistent calculation based on Kohn-Sham equations. And uh, the focus of uh, today's session is mainly to get uh, a bit familiar with uh, with the use of PW and uh, mainly on uh, to get a grasp and an idea on. Uh, how it scales on uh, HPC facility and uh, how to move uh, within uh, within uh, all the parameters which uh, define the parallel scheme uh, of PW. So uh, we are going to do four main exercises. Uh, the, the first three are focused on the parallelization uh, just on CPU. So we, I will show you the scheme uh, of parallelization based on MPI, then uh, OpenMP. Uh, and finally, we will uh, get hands on the GPUs. So we have to say that uh, most of the, our efforts of the last two years was focused on uh, GPU parallelization. So, uh, so mainly, uh, the setup uh, of the CPU parallelization is the one that uh, has been present for uh, the last years and the most of the innovation in uh, quantum espresso, let's say software technology uh, deals with uh, GPU acceleration. So, as you can see, uh, here is the, the flow of uh, classic uh, self-consistent calculation. So you get the input as input the molecular geometry, and uh, you perform uh, the classical uh, consham based uh, algorithm. So you, for each uh, iteration of PW, uh, you call uh, the so-called consham solvers. Uh, inside the, the consham solver routine, which are there are uh, quite many now. 
uh, I would say that the the fourth one is uh, the Davidson Davidson based uh, on Shams orders, but there are many others. Uh, who, Pietro talked about them, and in particular, the, the last one, RNMDII, seems to be the most promising in terms, terms of performance. However, inside uh, each uh, commission solver, you build up uh, the commission potential. And to do that, you have to use uh, the fast Fourier transform routines. Uh, uh, you also have to recall uh, the exchange correlation team to build uh, the exchange correlation term. And once you have built uh, your Hamiltonian, uh, you you have to diagonalize uh, and, uh, and you so you have to make use of specific diagonalization libraries and routines, which I will talk about later. So uh, before uh, starting with the main exercises, let's just uh, set up on our machine. So you should all have access to the Vega cluster. Uh, if you're not already connected, uh, you, could, uh, you can connect via the SSH. Please do it. And once you're in, uh, you should uh, be able to clone the GitLab repository where all the material uh, of the first two days is available. So uh, just type these comments you see on the screen and you should be. Please uh, uh, check uh, that everything is set by going to day one folder and then typing uh, PWD. See the result. It might be that uh, your uh, the result of your PWD is uh, different from mine. I don't know the actual file system, final file system uh, was set up by the staff. Everything should work. So uh, for the first three exercises, which are based on CPU parallelization, uh, we will use the already built-in module of Quantum Espresso, which is present on the cluster. This module is compiled with uh, GFortran, and uh, it makes use of uh, open source libraries uh, like OpenBLAS and FTW3 for uh, the fast Fourier transforms. Uh, most of you, I think, know, but uh, Quantum Espresso is uh, pretty flexible and can be compiled with a number of compilers. Uh, here I've shown just uh, the main ones, so GFortran, the Intel compiler i uh, the NVIDIA one, which is the XPGI, and uh, it can also run on uh, ARM architecture with, uh, with Flang. Uh, of course, it makes use of the standard libraries for the linear algebra, so OpenBLAS, NKL. NKL usually is a bit faster. But of course, it works only on uh, Intel and uh, AMD architecture. So, uh, in case you don't have, uh, you can you don't have access to these libraries. However, Quantum Espresso has also some internal ones, and uh, so basically, it's pretty pretty autonomous. So, I hope you all uh, you all got access to the cluster and uh, you clone the, the repository. Let's just do a try a first run, just to try that everything is in place. So in day one uh, repository, you should uh, find uh, the X0 folder, which is the folder for the, let's say, first preliminary run. And you will find uh, uh, in the input uh, folder, the input file for uh, basically for all today runs. But, uh, the the atom PBE is the input file for the zero run, let's say, which is this one I'm, I'm showing. So it's just a simple calculation for a single atom, so a single oxygen atom. Uh, Pietro already showed you showed you. In, how the input file is, uh, how we, it looks. Uh, basically, we have uh, a self-consistent calculation. 
We also added the stress flag, so it also calculates the stress at the end of the self-consistent uh, run. We have uh, uh, index one for uh, the Brave lattice, meaning that we are dealing with a cubic lattice, which is uh, pretty large because we are uh, doing a, we want to do a single atom calculation, so we just take a large cube with uh, one atom, of course one type of atom, and we get uh, six planes. So here it is also the cutoff in energy for the energy for the wave function and density. And, uh, and then finally, uh, in, under atomic species, you will find the name of the pseudo potential file, which in this case is the GGA PB based uh, pseudo for the oxygen ultra soft. So you, do, you should also find uh, the batch file, namely the, find, uh, the file to submit uh, the job through SLURM, which is the batch scheduler available uh, in this cluster. So uh, what I ask you to do, this preliminary exercise, let's say, is just to fill the dots in the batch file in order to run a, a very simple serial run. So I already tell you the answer, you just put one uh, everywhere and uh, it should work. So inside the batch file, you also find uh, the command to load uh, the built-in uh, Quantum Espresso version, which is the last release, 7.1. And uh, so you just fill uh, the dots and uh, sub submit with uh, the sbatch command. And then uh, uh, you can check the status of your submission by the command sq minus u, and uh, you just add your uh, username. So, Fabrizio, I would like to uh, maybe copy paste this into HackMD <clears throat> so that people can more easily uh, do it themselves. If you can just okay. maybe. It's difficult to, I think, to write these long, possibly long commands. For, um... No, no, but uh, it's already, everything is already in the batch file. So, yeah. Uh, they okay. just have to type uh, as batch uh, the, the, with the number, name of the file, which is x0 run. And uh, <laughs> everything else is uh, inside. So yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, I just leave here the the screen for let's say five minutes. So you just uh, get confident with uh, the machine and the submission stuff, uh, and then I will go on. Yes, that sounds good. Is it okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but from experience, I know that this is um, a error prone uh, step of a workshop when people log in and they're supposed to get started on running a job so please if anyone runs into any problems never mind how simple or complicated just let me know and we'll figure out a solution for sure i guess you all uh, submitted the job i hope uh, you also got the output uh, since we have a reservation you know, a certain number of nodes uh, and the job is very it's very fast you should all uh, be able to get uh, the output soon if you haven't it already. So here is the output. What you should see, uh, since we just sent a serial job, is uh, at the top of the file the number of MPI processes, the number of threads, everything is one of these, which just shows a serial, uh, serial run. Pietro already told you how the output of the PW works. Just a quick reminder, you go at the end of the file, you will find the total energy, the various contribution to the energy, stress, and uh, in the directory pwscf.save, you will find all the files uh, regarding the charge density, wave function, and the XML file with uh, all the data in XML format. You will see uh, tomorrow with the uh, post uh, self-consistent calculations like phonon, magnos, how to use uh, all these uh, output files which you get from uh, PW. <clears throat> 
And uh, uh, at the bottom of uh, the output file, uh, you will find also all the statistics regarding the computational time of the various routines of uh, PWs. So here you can see just the last ones, so FFT related ones, the, the total time, which is uh, the last time shown here for two PWSCF. Just, just uh, keep in mind this last uh, line, the output file, because uh, this is the time we will use uh, to, to do some plot uh, in the next exercises to see how performance goes on uh, our clusters. Okay, so we start with the first exercise. So basically, we are doing uh, our self-consistent calculation, which is based uh, on the Poinsham equations. So uh, what we do is uh, solve our Schrodinger equations in form of Poinsham, and uh, and we work uh, on the on a weight function which is expanded on a let's say a well-defined basis. Uh, this basis is made of uh, atomic orbitals. It's defined over atomic orbitals, K points, and the plane waves, as Pietro told you in the past presentation. So our parallelization scheme uh, will rely on, uh, will have to deal with this, uh, with this precise structure of our base. Let's say that uh, we can uh, we have three main parameters. So, and uh, let's put this uh, on a, on, a, on a graph. On one axis we have the k points. On the other axis we have the number of bands. And on the z axis we have the plane moves. Okay. And we get our wave function. We distribute our wave function as uh, let's say a three-dimensional array uh, over these three directions. So, what does quantum espresso do in order to parallelize the problem? Well, basically we have uh, our equation, which are pretty independent over the k points, since the, we solve a consham equation for each k points, and in the end we communicate to get uh, the, the total density and so on. So of course we have to exploit uh, this, uh, uh, let's say this uh, independence among uh, each kappa point for a large chunk uh, of the of the algorithm. So a good parallelization scheme, of course, uh, have to exploit uh, the the k points uh, scheme. Of course, uh, we have a bunch of uh, most of the calculation. We have a bunch of plane waves over which we expand uh, our wave function. So we cannot avoid parallelization also on plane waves. Even if, uh, uh, since uh, the wave function is sum over uh, all the plane waves, uh, we cannot avoid communication. So let's, I will show you here. We apply, we usually apply all the operators or to single orbitals and we sum over all the plane waves. So what we can do is we just separate our run uh, based on k points. And uh, we, we perform a parallelization inside each k points over a, a chunk of plane waves. So what we obtain? We obtain a number of runs each one taking care of, uh, let's say for now, 1k points. Uh, and inside each, uh, each rank, we parallelize again over the, the plane waves. Okay. So what happens? Of course, uh, uh, when we parallel in, uh, inside each k points, we have a number of processors which deal with the uh, a group of uh, plane waves. All these processors inside the single k points must communicate with each other in order to complete the summation over all the plane waves, because we need uh, the complete expansion to get uh, our wave function. 
But, among, but uh, between one key points and the other, the communication uh, is, is much lower. I would say there is no communication until uh, we have to compute uh, the, the total density. So what's our goal? Our goal is to separate uh, all our MPA tasks and distribute them uh, over uh, all the K points. And inside K points, doing uh, another uh, level of parallelization, which deals with the summation over uh, plane waves. The aim is to reduce uh, in the to reduce the, as much as possible all the communication between the ranks. So we want to reduce the, as much as possible the we want uh, we want a few chunk of plane waves, and we want to exploit all the available k points. So what we we, we do is uh, what we call a pool-based uh, parallelism scheme. So we just distribute uh, the set of K points among uh, all the available MPI tasks uh, we have. OK. And inside uh, each MPI task, uh, we just exploit uh, all the processor uh, we just exploit uh, the parallelization over uh, the plane waves. In this way, uh, we just uh, make use of uh, the independence among one K points with respect to the others and uh, limit as much as possible the communication to the summation over the plane waves. Okay. So, What's our goal? Our goal is when we want to run a PW calculation over a cluster, we just uh, look uh, at the structure of our uh, of our node. In our case, uh, we have the, at our disposal just one node, and one node uh, has uh, sixty four uh, processors, at least on the CPU partition. On the GPU, the, uh, they are uh, one hundred twenty twenty eight. So what we want to do is we take uh, our uh, our input file for our uh, self-consistent calculation. We see how many kappa points uh, we need. We see how many kappa points our calculation use. And we decide how many pools uh, we have to, how many pools we want uh, based on the, the number of uh, processors we have and the number of key points. So let's make an example. If we have, uh, for example, let's say eight K points and uh, 16 processor, 16, uh, let's say, MPI task, what are we going to do? Well, we can choose uh, eight pools, OK, so that uh, um, each pool take uh, two nodes, which compute uh, one K point. OK, this is uh, the configuration which uses uh, the least amount of communication between one processor and the others. Of course, we can uh, try different options over the pools. So let's say 8, uh, 16, 4, 2, and see how it works. So what I propose you to do uh, with the first exercise is just to explore the pool parallelization scheme. So you have uh, the input file, which Pietro described you in the past presentation about the oxid uh, right. Uh, what you do is you take the batch file, which, which you find in day one exercise, and you fill uh, the last lines of the batch file uh, with, the pro with the proper values of uh, n pools. So you will do multiple runs. And uh, for each run, you will look at uh, the output file, take the final, uh, let's say, the time that the job uh, takes for a single value of n pool, which is the number of pools. And you will do a plot. So you will plot the, the time uh, that your run takes in function of uh, the number of pool you choose. And uh, you can observe uh, how 
the performance improve uh, based on uh, the value of the parameter you choose, of the endpool parameter you choose. And then uh, we will see what it comes out. So what you just have to do is to open the batch file, put uh, a set of values for n pool, and submit the batch files, and then uh, do a plot. You also find all the instructions in the readme file uh, in the repository, the x1 uh, pools uh, folder. So let's say I give you 10 to 15 minutes to get confident with this, uh, do your plot, uh, and then we will discuss uh, what's happening. So you can see the batch file. You have uh, 16 processor. Uh, no, uh, sorry, you have uh, 32 processors. Uh, Okay, so you have 16 processors and uh, one task for each one. And you adapt uh, the you adapt uh, the end pool values based on what you have. There is a request to maybe explain briefly the lines in the script. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the script. This is a batch file for the batch scheduler Slurm, which is the one used by the cluster. What it does basically it tells uh, it tells uh, what uh, resources you want to exploit for uh, for your run, and then it sends the run uh, to, the, to the cluster for computation. Basically, uh, in the the upper part of the file where there are all the sbatch commands, uh, you just uh, need to fill them with the specific specification of uh, your run and uh, uh, your system. So first line, uh, you have one node. You have one node because uh, each one of you has, uh, can use uh, just one node. Uh, exclusive means that uh, uh, when you send your run, uh, the nodes, uh, uh, the, the, the whole nodes is reserved for your run. This is to avoid uh, to avoid some troubles, which uh, comes out sometimes. Actually, at least which we experimented sometimes in the past days. Then there's the time limit for your job. Here it's set to twenty minutes. Actually, you can also set it to ten uh, or even le let's say ten if you want. Then the, there is the partition uh, CPU. Uh, this uh, just specifies that uh, we run on the on the nodes uh, which have uh, CPU and not the GPU. The nodes with GPU, which we use later, uh, are called, uh, the partition referred to those nodes uh, is called the uh, GPU. And then uh, here we got we get uh, in some details about the architecture. But uh, let's say that uh, each node uh, is uh, divided into two sockets, and each socket uh, has uh, 32 processor. Uh, let's say that for this run, uh, the optimal configuration is just to take uh, 16 processor, distributing them on uh, two sockets. I will not go into detail of, of the architecture more than this, but let's, uh, let's keep it fixed. Then uh, CPUs per task is basically the number of CPUs uh, uh, for each MPI task, so namely the number of threads. We put it just to one to begin. So we just do a pure MPI run. And then uh, the output uh, and the error are the, if you want, they, they're not mandatory, but if you want to specify a file where the, uh, all the error messages related to the system uh, can be put, uh, you can do it. I did it and called it uh, CSER. You can also add uh, your mail. Uh, to get uh, some some warning or uh, to just receive the notification when your job starts, um, but it's not it's not essential. So uh, then you just uh, load uh, what is needed for your run. In our case, we just have uh, our built-in module, which is the 7.1 version of Quantum Espresso. 
and then we just export the environment variable related to the uh, input directory, output directory, the one with the pseudo potential files, and, and so on. In principle, if you specify the one CPU per task, uh, there is no strict need to specify also the environment variable OMP, OMP num threads, but we just do it. And then, uh, and then you call the MPA run, uh, which is the command to run your job uh, on a MPI scheme. Okay, thank you. So, do we have fifteen minutes now? Yeah, let's say fifteen minutes, and then uh, we go. On. So, as you can see here. This is pretty much uh, a graph uh, like uh, yours uh, should be look, uh, I mean, your plot should be look, uh, quite similar to this. Maybe the whole time might be different, a bit less, because uh, this specific, uh, specific graph was made of runs uh, made of another machine. But uh, let's say the the general uh, trend uh, should be similar. Some of you told me that uh, you got uh, eight pools uh, as the best value, which is exactly right. So why it's eight pools? Well, because we choose uh, 16 processors and by choosing eight pool, uh, we just uh, put uh, two processors for one pool. That means that uh, we have uh, uh, we have reduced a lot the communication uh, by distributing all our CPUs among uh, the K points available, which are eight. So with four, four pools, we have more communication inside each node. And of course, the maximum communication is uh, with just one pool. So, OK, this is uh, for the MPI parallelization with 10 pools. Now let's go to the second stage. So we have our self-consistent algorithm, which is made of, uh, which is based on our conscience solvers. Uh, inside each conscience solvers, we build up our matrices, our Hamiltonian matrices. And of course, uh, at some point, we have to diagonalize them in order to get the bands uh, and the energies for each band. So uh, for this uh, diagonalization part, uh, we use uh, libraries. And uh, it's a pretty recent uh, implementation uh, that we did uh, to introduce uh, parallel, lib parallel uh, routines for, uh, diagonalization of diagonalization libraries in order to improve performance at this stage of the flow. So basically, we, we included uh, the ELPA library. And uh, which is, OK, this is the main one. So this graph shows the trend, uh, the performance trend uh, in function of the matrix size for uh, the main libraries of diagonalization, namely ELPA and uh, MKL. As you can already see, uh, we have a big advantage in using parallel libraries as the matrix size grows. But if we go uh, in the region where the matrix size is, uh, is pretty small, let's say under a few hundreds of units, well, we see that uh, the serial algorithm is still uh, the most uh, advantageous one. So what you, you have to take home from here, well, there are very efficient uh, parallelization and uh, diagonalization, parallel diagonalization routines, uh, named uh, in particular from the Elpa library. But uh, uh, they are advantageous only for uh, when your matrix becomes large. So if you need uh, a number to refer to, let's say that uh, over uh, 100 bands, 
uh, we can start to see some uh, some advantages by using the parallel diagonalization libraries. So what we do in the next exercise is to get our hands on uh, the diagonalization, the parallel diagonalization in quantum espresso. So what we're going to do? Well, now we worked with the end pool parameter. And now uh, we set also the end yag parameter. What is the end yag parameter? Uh, basically, it's a number that specifies uh, the number of sus subspaces you divide uh, your matrix to diagonalize uh, in order to parallelize the algorithm. So uh, the, start, the default value for NDAG is one, namely serial, uh, paralleliz serial diagonalization. I suggest you to experiment some values, uh, let's say under 10, and see how your job, uh, how your runs, uh, how the total time of your runs uh, vary in function of this parameter. The input file is the same of the first exercise. And we just keep the same configuration, so 16 uh, processors with uh, no trades. In the next exercise, we'll introduce OpenMP, but for now, we are still at the uh, MPI stage. OK. So first exercise, you got uh, eight pools as uh, optimal parameter. Now you can set and pull uh, to the value you prefer. Uh, in the exercise is set to four, but there's no specific reason. And you just work on the end yang parameter. Okay. And do uh, the same job you did uh, with the first exercise for end yang. Okay. So uh, I give you for this, uh, let's say another 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll see something a bit more uh, challenging, not too much. Okay, so you go uh, in the GitLab, in the directory of the GitLab repo not called uh, EX2. Uh, uh, and Yag. You have the batch file uh, to fill as the end pool exercise and provide a plot. Okay, yes, as your colleague said, uh, there is no significant improvement. And uh, just because our system is pretty small and uh, we had to adapt to a single node but uh, at least uh, you saw that you can use parallel diag diagonalization and uh, you can use uh, this uh, this capability of quantum espresso for your own job your own production when you will have to run uh, much bigger uh, much bigger systems let's say so of course, uh, uh, the thing is always the same. Uh, the bigger is the system we work with, uh, the more efficient, the more efficient is uh, the parallelization scheme uh, we work with. So uh, in this case, uh, the eigenvalue problem is too small to, to see a, a significant improvement in performance. Uh, but uh, that means that uh, that not, doesn't mean that it's not useful. You just have to work at a larger scale in order to see something, something uh, significant. Okay, and this is also the, the main characteristic of uh, the ELPA library. It's a very efficient library for diagonalization. The yeah, di diagonalization routines from ELPA are very efficient, very good, uh, but uh, they are useful for very large systems. Otherwise, it might also be uh, very disadvantages, disadvantages. So, okay, 
let's pass now to the OpenMP parallelization. So, uh, of course, uh, Quantum Espresso is, uh, was built uh, starting from an MPI parallelization scheme because of the nature of the problem, let's say. When we have a consham uh, algorithm, which is which is an intrinsic distribution over a number of points, so K points, the natural way to start to build a parallelization scheme is uh, MPI. However, uh, we also implemented a second stage, which is the OpenMP. Namely, inside each task, uh, the workload is distributed as possible on the available CPUs, uh, which are not working. Uh, in the serial part of in the serial part of the of each task. So as you can see here is uh, there are two graphs which shows the performance of quantum espressos in quantum espressos in function of the number of core. One is for uh, pure MPI scaling and uh, the other the red one is for the pure open MP scaling. As you can see the MPI scaling is much better because of the as I said, because of Quantum Espresso is native uh, for MPI parallelization scheme. And, uh, but also you can see in the second graph, which reflect in some way the under law, that uh, the parallelized, uh, parallelized portion of the Quantum Espresso code is 95% uh, sorry. Uh, is 95% uh, uh, parallelized MPI and only 76% parallelized uh, OpenMP. So, uh, as you know, the for the AMDA law, uh, if you parallelize uh, 0. Uh, 95% of the code, this, the maximum speed up cannot go uh, beyond uh, 20 times the the performance of uh, one single code. So, of course, uh, uh, the pure MPI is much more efficient than the pure OpenMP. For basically, for the structure for how Quantum Espresso was, uh, Quantum Espresso was pinned uh, and uh, parallelization was implemented. However, this doesn't mean that uh, OpenMP is not useful. Here, this is, there is an interesting plot uh, which was made by Ivan Carnimeo, uh, which shows uh, how Quantum Espresso, the performance of uh, Quantum Espresso, namely a PW calculation, self-consistent calculation of uh, 190 water mole molecules. So you can see that uh, each trend goes from uh, a pure OpenMP run to a pure OpenMP run. And uh, in the intermediate, intermediate stages of, the of each trend, there are uh, different portions of uh, MPI run, MPI task, and OpenMP threads. OK. So what you can see is that, uh, of course, uh, how we could uh, we could see before, the pure OpenMP is the less efficient uh, configuration. But we can also see that the pure uh, MPI is not the more efficient one. So basically, what we have to do is to find a, a sort of balance between uh, MPI processes and uh, OpenMP threads. As you can see, for each trend, there's a minimum, uh, which is located around, uh, let's say, two to eight threads. Okay, so you can see also with a big, with a larger number of nodes. And here you can see uh, much better on a five nodes uh, trend. Okay, so. What should we take on from here? Well, basically that uh, Quantum Espresso works well with uh, four uh, open MP threads, from two to four, not more. So um, basically, uh, let's say in some cases also eight threads is enough, but uh, almost never above uh, eight threads. 
So the best uh, configuration, if you have uh, all the available resources, is uh, just uh, spread your job uh, over uh, all the MPI tasks you have at your disposal. Just reserve uh, four two to four threads uh, for each of the MPI tasks you have. And that should give you, in most of the cases, the most optimized uh, performance uh, for uh, your configuration. Okay, so uh, just one thing again about uh, the uh, about the nodes parallelization, so the MPI scheme. So here we see, uh, let's say a special case. So we have five nodes, okay, and 30K points. So basically, uh, we should think that uh, three, three pools is the best configuration uh, for our system because we have 30K points. So we can just split uh, the K points into three sets of 10 points and everything should work. Uh, so we should have uh, three pools uh, which work uh, well uh, on the MPI level. The thing is that uh, if we are working on five nodes, we have three pools which needs to be distributed on five nodes, not three nodes. So what happens? What happens is that the communication among the nodes increase a lot. So that means that even if in theory, the choice for three pools seems to be the best, in practice, by looking at the number of nodes we want to use, the best choice is still five pools. So we have a distribution of K points, which is not uh, that as uniform as uh, in the free pool case, but uh, uh, we exploit uh, in a much better way uh, the resources uh, which comes from five nodes, the availability of five nodes. So this is just to say that, uh, okay, when you decide how many pools you have to run, you also have to take into account the number of nodes you have at your disposal, as you can see from the graph. And then, of course, you can also implement the OpenMP part and optimize your run. Okay, so this brings us to the third exercise. So basically, uh, in this exercise, we will have some a bit more freedom than the, the first two. So what you have to do is you have uh, the usual your usual node, and uh, you can play with the parameters uh, you learn to use. So and pools, and the arg. Well, we learned that and the arg is not very useful in this case. But okay, you can also vary the number of tasks. And uh, now you can uh, work uh, on the number of threads too. Okay, so you file, uh, you find all the instruction in the readme file, and you also find uh, find the batch file in the X3 or B folder. So you just take uh, that file and you fill uh, where the you fill all the spaces where the dots are present, and basically you just uh, the, the goal of this exercise is to find the best configuration you can, which gives you the best performance. So just ferry and pulls, uh, the number of threads, the number of tasks, and, uh, and try to see uh, which is uh, the, the setup that gives you the, the smallest time as possible. So excuse me for interrupting. I, I think... So, we, we yeah. should combine um, this exercise with a break. It's been a while since we had a, a proper break. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So how much time for the exercise? So I would say that, uh, let's say, 20 minutes, and then uh, I will ask you how it's going, and then uh, we will pass to the GPU part. So, OK. Uh, now we saw different parallelization levels based on CPU stuff. Now we pass to GPUs, which is basically the 
the target of our work for the last uh, two years at least. Uh, why? Well, because uh, all the HPC facilities and technologies is focusing on exploiting uh, GPUs much more than simple uh, CPUs uh, schemes. This is mainly for uh, gain in energy consumption and for various reasons, but this is uh, what we have to deal with. So Quantum Espresso is, uh, is on this way too. So up to now, uh, you can uh, compile Quantum, if you want to use uh, Quantum Espresso with GPU, uh, you are forced to, to compile it with uh, uh, the NVIDIA compiler, which is NV Fortran, which is the XPGI compiler. And uh, this is uh, because uh, up to now, uh, uh, Quantum Espresso is supported uh, partly with the CUDA and partly with the OpenACC. And uh, we, are move, we are transitioning to a pretty full OpenACC porting by erasing uh, all the GPU double stuff uh, related to CUDA code. But still, uh, the dependence of uh, yeah, on uh, NV Fortran is uh, unavoidable up to now. So uh, our uh, our Quantum Espresso version, uh, for GPU version, is now compiled with NV Fortran. It makes use of the uh, NVIDIA libraries for uh, for uh, linear algebra, so namely Kublas, and uh, for the fast Fourier transform, so. QFFT. So, uh, how does the porting work in Quantum Express or GPU? Well, basically, uh, what we do is uh, we do we try to shift uh, all the possible computations inside uh, each MPI task uh, on the GPU. Uh, on the GPU, uh, but we have to keep in mind that up to now, there is no communication from GPU to GPU. So this means that uh, each computation uh, has to be ported on GPU, executed, the results must be imported from GPU back to the CPU, and then if you have to do communication, you do it among CPU only. This might uh, change uh, partly in the near future, but up to now, this is, uh, this is what we have to deal with. Okay. So uh, what we want to do, of course, when porting on GPU is to minimize uh, data transfer. So this means that uh, still we want to, to use uh, one GPU for each rank so that uh, we have to move data only on the CPU, do our computation, get back on uh, the MPI task, and then communicate with other MPI tasks. Okay, so in this case, you see that uh, we split our wave function into two chunks of uh, plane waves. The rank one does his computation on his chunk of plane waves, the rank two does the same, then they get back the results and they combine what they have to combine. It is not convenient to, to use more tasks for one GPU just because uh, you overload uh, the GPUs of work because one rank uh, shift all she works on the GPU and the GPU works for, let's say, rank one. And then it also receives uh, the, the needed the request of computation for rank two test to manage uh, uh, two different computation uh, which fill uh, all the GPU uh, processing units. So this uh, translates into a slowdown. I mean, uh, you, you can have uh, in some very specific cases some little gain of performance, but uh, in most of the cases, this is not advantageous. So what you have to take home from here is just choose one GPU for MPI task, not more. Okay, so 
again, uh, this is what happens. So uh, we you, we can use uh, the usual uh, scheme, uh, MPI scheme. So we can still uh, work with pools. We can still uh, work with the uh, NDAG. Uh, and still, we can add uh, OpenMP uh, to our, uh, let's say, to our parallel schemes. You just have to keep in mind that uh, most of the parts uh, that uh, were computed with OpenMP now, if you have a GPU active, will be computed with GPU. So the area of influence of OpenMP over the code is uh, much limited if we use uh, GPUs. Okay, so one GPU per rank, and uh, and basically that's it. So what you have to do with when uh, you run uh, Quantum Espresso, you have to do all the things uh, we just did. So set and pulls, set and diag, set uh, the number of threads. But uh, take uh, take. Uh, just uh, use, uh, just find out how many GPUs you know that, and set a number of MPI tasks uh, which is equal to the number of GPUs. Okay. So uh, what we have to do uh, in this exercise is you take uh, uh, the best, uh, let's say the best. Uh, configuration uh, that you obtain, uh, which gave you the best performance with only CPUs. And uh, you try to compare it with uh, a GPU run, uh, which exploit all the GPU resources you have on your node. So you have the batch files, which runs uh, on the GPUs, which runs on the GPU partition. You fill the dots, as usual. And you see uh, which is the performance you get uh, by using all the GPUs. I already tell you that each node on the GPU partitions has uh, four uh, GPUs. So, of course, you have to use uh, four MPI tasks. Then you can play with uh, OpenMP2 and see uh, which is the performance you get. And then you can do a nice comparison between, uh, let's say, four MPI with four GPU and uh, maximum number of MPI time stress you use to get the best performance on the CPU partition. So you can have a very rough, I would say, but a very rough idea of the, uh, how to say, on uh, how many CPU, how many pure CPUs the resources you need to match uh, just uh, for, uh, for CPUs plus for GPUs. Of course, uh, you can go much farther than the results you will get with this exercise by going on larger facilities and with much larger runs, but at least you can grasp an idea here, the advantages of using GPUs. So, okay, what you have to do is uh, go to the exercise for folder, which is uh, X4 GPU. And you will find, uh, well, basically, you, you find a batch file Zlurm, with, uh, which is uh, highly optimized on the uh, CPU node. So it, you can run it if you want to get a reference, but probably you will obtain the same performance with your uh, own runs. And then you have the batch file for GPU. So which runs on the GPU partition, which make use of the all four uh, GPUs. So what I would say you, what I would suggest you to do is to run the batch file for GPU and see how it compare, how the performance compare to your CPU runs. And then you can play by changing the number of uh, GPUs and also the number of threads and see how the scaling goes in function of your, the parameters that define your, uh, your parallelization choice. So you find, uh, as usual, you find the instruction in the readme file. 
and uh, you find uh, in the reference folder you find uh, the already filled in uh, batch files the the main outputs. Okay, so uh, we have ten minutes. So what I would suggest you to do is to run the batch file uh, you have uh, for GPU. You can find the field, the one already filled in in the reference, so you get uh, the idea. And then, uh, if you want to play, I would suggest you to play. You can do it uh, later in the afternoon, and uh, I will take the last uh, five to ten minutes to to tell you some conclusion about uh, GPUs and the state of the art of quantum express supporting. Okay, so. Let's say you wait uh, five minutes, you just send the batch file for GPU, and then we'll go to, to the last uh, last part. Okay, so sorry, but due to time constraint, I best to just let me know in the chat if any one of you got uh, the output from uh, GPU submission, even while I'm talking. And, uh, let me share the screen. So basically, uh, here is a graph. Again, uh, uh, the wall time uh, on the axe uh, on the axis is a bit different. Might be different from yours because this test was run on another facility. But still, it can it should get uh, should get the same uh, trend uh, on, uh, on your machine. So here is shown uh, the uh, CPU runs versus GPU runs for a certain number of pools. And uh, as you see, you get uh, much improved performance. Of course, uh, uh, the comparison between uh, CPU only and CPU plus GPU is not that fair because when you use a uh, GPU, you have more uh, computational power. So it's not that you compare uh, Two different, uh, let's say, two concurrent stuff. Uh, a fair comparison should be as you are doing uh, for the exercise to run uh, a certain amount of CPUs plus GPUs and see how to match the same performance with uh, CPU only, CPU only configuration. But still, uh, in most of the cases, this is the kind of graph uh, you see to to show how GPU improve performance. So here is batch file the GPU. So uh, what we should uh, what we should take from today uh, here is a sort of minimal recipe which you, you should take with tongs but still might be useful. So when you have to run, uh, I'm talking about PW, then tomorrow you will see more parallelization levels related to more codes uh, inside the Quantum Espresso package. But for the self-consistent calculation, this is what you should take. So you choose a number of MPI tasks based on the dimension of the fast Fourier transform grid and the number of K points. Okay, so. Just see the size of your system, of your problems, and uh, guess a number of tasks uh, which should cover your problem, your system. Then, if you have GPUs, just use them. So, uh, it's, uh, the, the coverage of the GPU porting uh, in uh, Quantum Espresso code is pretty large now and is still growing. So, uh, it's, uh, it should be enough to take a serious advantage with respect to GPU only runs and take just one GPU for MPI task. And you can also combine uh, OpenMP with uh, GPUs uh, and uh, by using the same rules uh, you, I told you for CPU only systems. So two to four uh, threads should be always the optimal choice. Then you set up your MPI parallelization scheme uh, over the K points uh, by choosing the number of pools. 
Again, the number of pools uh, uh, must depend on the dimension of uh, your problem. So dimension of the FF degrees, the number of K points. So you have to make sure to distribute K points smoothly among uh, your nodes, your MPI task, sorry. And then, uh, of course, you also have to take into account uh, the number of nodes, because as I showed you in a preceding slide, uh, it's not that uh, the, the best division of uh, the number of K points among, uh, among pools uh, is, the best, uh, is the best for performance. If you have five nodes, three pools, and 30 K points, you still have to choose, uh, let's say, uh, five pools in order to match uh, the, the, in order to match the CPU resources you have at your disposal and to reduce communication. Okay, so fourth step, uh, you can set the parallel diagonalization. This is reserved for a very large system only, so I would say uh, for, uh, the N, for the number of bands which is uh, bigger than 100. Otherwise, it's pretty useless as you saw in uh, the second exercise. And then uh, you choose the number of threads to exploit uh, the OpenMP part. Again, uh, just up to four is uh, usually the, the optimal choice. You can try to go up to eight sometimes, but never beyond eight. Okay, see, these are the minimal structures I would I would say to, to take home and uh, when you want to run the PW, PW job. So let me just show briefly some performance uh, results for uh, Quantum Espresso on GPUs. As you can see, of course, uh, uh, the larger the, the part of data is offloaded to the GPU, the lesser is the, the communication. So basically, you still have to optimize uh, all the parallel scheme, uh, all your MPI parallel scheme, in order to, uh, to fit into your, the available GPUs all the work uh, you can. So you can see from the first graph that the parallelization of over pools still works for uh, the GPU case. And in the second graph, you see uh, how, sorry, how for a system with, uh, um, for a system with uh, 26 uh, K points, the optimal number of pools uh, is four. Why? Because uh, basically, uh, in this, this is a GPU run. So you have uh, four GPUs, as is shown uh, at the top of the graph. And so four pools uh, is still uh, the, the configuration that allows you to shift uh, the most amount of data on the available GPUs, avoiding uh, a, larger, a large number of communication, which is done in the, the case of uh, two and one pool. So, Still, you have to do all the work uh, in order to set up your parallel scheme, just take into account that you have to adapt to the number of GPUs you have. Okay, so of course, uh, the more or the bigger is your system and your facility, the larger is the advantage you get. Uh, what I will show you in the last slide is the amount of porting uh, of the Quantum Espresso code. So basically, uh, the develop of uh, this, uh, this graph is updated to the 7.0 version. Now we are 7.1. Basically, all the parts uh, shown here have been ported on GPU. So actually, this is, uh, you should be, you should get a very good amount of uh, performance improvement uh, starting from seven, version 7.1 up to now, as you can see in the lower, uh, lower graph. So in the lower graph, you see a comparison between uh, CPU-only uh, nodes with uh, 760 MPI and four threads each. 
uh, in the in the second column you see um, the time per iteration of a uh, sorry i didn't say that uh, the system is a carbon nanotube so a very large system of uh, uh, more than 1000 atoms so you see the comparison between a uh, gpu only facility which takes uh, 92 seconds per iteration then a facility with 144 gpus so basically 144 uh, uh, gpus each one having a one gpu which takes 30 seconds and then uh, one node with uh, just 24 gpus of the last generation so ampere 100 with 80 gigabyte memory each and basically we get uh, 32 seconds so uh, this is uh, let's say the comparison you did uh, in this last fourth exercise uh, at a much bigger scale let's say where you say that of course you see of course that 24 uh, last generation gpus with 24 cores uh, just uh, it's much better than uh, 768 times for uh, CPUs for a GPU only configuration. So, this should uh, convince you that uh, GPU porting is the direction we should all, uh, we should all take for the, the future, present and future development of Quantum Espresso. So, this is basically the same. So, I can stop here. And thank you all.